Hi everyone. Uh, uh, um, it's a great pleasure for me, for reasons that are both intellectual and personal, to introduce Michael Holkus as our speaker today. You are all, no doubt, to a greater or smaller extent familiar with Professor Holquist's incredibly broad-ranging work, scholarly, pedagogical, and on behalf of the profession, which I hope he will permit me to designate with its forgotten, frequently forgotten, but proper name, philology. <laughs> uh, after receiving his PhD from uh, uh, the Slavic department at Yale, Professor Holquist stayed on for several years and was instrumental in designing the, at the time, controversial, uh, but strikingly forward-looking course, Literature X, and ultimately in establishing the literature major at Yale. After sojourns in Texas and Indiana, and the start of a lifelong engagement with the work of Mikhail Bakhtin, Professor Holquist returned to Yale in comparative literature department, which he went on to chair for many years, and where, among other things, he went also on to co-design with Vlashny Kupan, yet another groundbreaking course, this time on world literature. Uh, and by the way, according to a model which I personally believe to be the only appropriate model uh, of, all, uh, 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 of all the different ways one could teach world literature. Uh, on, more, on that more, uh, you could ask uh, Professor Holquist if you'd like. Um, Professor Holquist retired from Yale in 2004, or I should say, quote unquote, retired, because he then immediately went on to serve as president of the MLA and to teach a wide range of courses at CUNY, NYU, and Columbia, uh, um, where he's now a member of Society of Senior Scholars. And I'm very happy to see some of the beneficiaries of the last 10 years of his pedagogical activity in this audience. Um, Professor Holquist has published on a wide variety of topics in literature, on utopian and detective fiction, Lewis Carroll, Dostoevsky, Gogol, Tolstoy, and others, um, as well as in literary theory and philosophy. But his most sustained engagement over the years has been with the work of Mikhail Bakhtin, and so I'm especially pleased that in this lecture, Professor Holquist has agreed to return to that fascinating figure once again, with a hindsight of 35 years of engagement. So please welcome Michael Holquist on the footnote in Bhakti. Thank you for that. Um, I, I begin by making two excuses. I mean, one, um, you know, that thing they sent out saying what people are going to talk about was agreed on some time ago. And in the meantime, uh, a number of things have happened to make some changes. So uh, I'm not, in fact, going to be talking about Shklovsky today. Uh, There's a very good article, I mean, some of you may already know it, by Carol Emerson on Shklovsky and uh, Bakhtin. Uh, so if, if that's your interest, I, I, I uh, encourage you to go to uh, Poetics Today and, and read her article. Uh, the, the second uh, apology I wish to make is uh, that I, I, I just uh, had some tests, and my eyes are not working as well as they, they should be, so that the reading of this paper will perhaps be a little rough in places. Uh, and I uh, apologize for that. At any rate, here we are. Bakhtin is now so widely invoked that it's difficult to know what the name means when it's used. His name now has the status frequently invoked by Wisilowski and his advocates in the historical workings group, uh, working group, uh, the status of res nullius, uh, a thing in Roman law that was not yet the object of nor had the rights of any specific subject. Such items were considered ownerless property like wild animals in ungoverned forests or objects found on the beach. So Bakhtin is cited as a master in many different disciplines as a result of this status, and often with a personal fervor combined with an assumed intimacy that is unusual, especially when referencing a figure of authority. The dilemma is complicated by several factors not least confusion about how to professionally 
frame his achievement. Is he a literary theorist, a philosopher, and intimidating the erudite scholar, or an intellectual fraud? The convoluted chronology of Bakhtin's published works, the loving but often frustrating devotion of those like Sergei Bacharov and Vadim Kozhenov who held Bakhtin's papers, all of this has led to the emergence of the phenomenon Peter Hitchcock highlighted in the title for a special edition of South Atlantic Quarterly called uh, Bakhtin, and then slash quotation marks Bakhtin, quotation marks. The slash and the quotation marks were meant to indicate a gap between the figure who was born in 1895 and died in 1975 and the different versions of that thinker put forward by an ever-growing number of commentators. With all due respect to Peter Hitchcock, I begin by questioning this dichotomy since it opens the possibility of a kind of unquotation marked Bakhtin who might stand over against the many different Bakhtinian personae defined in subsequent scholarship. My reservation is based on one of the few points where there is some consensus among critics. The central place in the canon occupied by Bakhtin's lifelong meditation on the self-other distinction as a complex dialogue between author and hero. All of Bakhtin's live inside quotation marks, as the author Bakhtin argued insofar as every act is a local manifestation of the phenomena ruling discourse, such as history, the nature of human language, and the central role played by the exchange between unique and self selves, um, and others who are equally unique, it is itself a kind of free, indirect discourse. So in my remarks today, I'll try to keep in mind the constantly emerging nature of the phenomena. In doing so, I'll assume there is no grand, coherent, all-inclusive theory of dialogism. Rather, I, I see a series of attempts over time to define the mystery of relation itself, where relation is understood not merely as a specific relation, such as that between self and other, although it is Joaquin's favorite example of how relation works, but as a master category governing both thought and action. And this, of course, he is not unique among modern thinkers, but the way in which he frames the question is arguably original. Having said so much about the uncertainties that swirl about his name, it would be counterintuitive to deny that Bakhtin's writings display a changing, not always successful, but recurrent set of strategies and terms that he deployed at different times to address different subjects. We may not agree on what in a given work he is saying about a particular topic, but perhaps we can jointly recognize recurring patterns in the way he crafts his argument. I have in mind here not only certain frequently encountered ticks of rhetoric, but rather familiar patterns of sconic, sonic concern that underline his very various individual investigations. Is there a master question that animates Bakhtin's manifold separate topics, such as the nature of language, satire, the novel, or the omnipresence of dialogic structure in human existence? I believe there is. If we discriminate between the wide-ranging topics and styles that we find in Bakhtin's individual works from the same recurring question that they are all deployed to, to meditate. That question, I'll suggest, is one that goes back to pre-Platonic thinkers such as Salis and Heraclitus, but which is also at the heart of our own digitally driven age. The question is, how are we to conceive the relation between pattern and event as a way to think the mystery of relation itself? Can there be knowledge of anything that is singular? If so, how are we to evaluate the relation of the repeatable to the unique? In other words, how can they be made synchronous, what Kant will call a union of opinion? Bluntly put, 
what I'm trying to suggest is that hovering over the categories that emerge in Buckstein's work over the years, the, the familiar litany of author, hero, chronotope, novelist, or glossia, satire, utterance, indeed, dialogue itself is the question of the one and the many. His shifting preoccupations all seem to be a search for tools to think about how things relate to each other. And the relation he examines in each case is grounded in simultaneity. The enigma of how otherwise disparate things, ideas, or people can nevertheless exist together in time, space, and society, or perhaps not. Martin's first published work was a small essay published in a fleeting miscellany in the provincial town of Nevis in 1919, a particularly hectic year of the Russian Civil War. This short piece, Art and Answerability, can be read as a kind of manifesto for what has come to be called dialogism. His opening lines are, I'm not quoting uh, in translation now, a whole is called mechanical when its constituent elements are united only in space and time by some external connection and are not imbued with the internal unity of meaning." End quote. A general term for the effort to understand how things go together is architectonics, of course, a term that occurs frequently in Buckstein, early and late. In Art and Answerability, he specifically is concerned with the dilemma of how art relates to life. How do they go together? A question that will haunt him all his life. But above and beyond the question, that particular question about art, is the larger question of how to interpret the relation of parts to wholes in general. The major responsibility confronting human beings, he argues, is to join the things we encounter in the world that in themselves would otherwise remain alien to each other. At the beginning of his career, Buckstein characterized this need to connect as an urgent demand that is arguably more epistemological slash existential than ethical, although it's often been taken that way. Uh, he says, I have to answer with my own life for what I have experienced and understood so that everything I have experienced and understood would not remain ineffectual in my life. And at the end of his life, in the notes that were published as methodology in the human sciences, which just a bunch of notes, really, uh, he is still insisting on the existential mandate to create meaning through ar architectonics. I quote from the, the last notes in, from 1971, the task consists in forcing the thing-like environment which mechanically influences the personality to begin to speak that is, to reveal in it the potential word and tone, to transform it into a semantic context for the thinking, speaking, and acting, as well as creating personality." End quote. I begin by emphasizing the central demand that creating meaning by putting the world together in a comprehensive simultaneity, architectonics, plays in Buckingham's work early in life. I do so because what might be called the architectonic imperative provides a way into understanding one of the central problems for any student of Buckstein, namely his relationship to Kantian and post-Kantian philosophy. Buckstein, as has frequently been noted, was not particularly generous in footnoting his work. And when he does provide a footnote, it is not always helpful. Uh, the very insignificance of the footnote in its rank as a genre magnifies in its concision the somewhat outrageous generalities of his text themselves. Perhaps the most infamous example of Buckingham's idiosyncratic way with, our, our, uh, with, the first, with footnotes are the first two footnotes found in the well-known essay on forms of time and chronotope in the novel from 1937 and 1973. This is particularly true of the second footnote, which is, I, I, I'm going to quote it full. He says, in his Transcendental Aesthetics, one of the main sections of his 
particular pure reason. It's a, a, a masterful understatement. I, 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 Kant defines space and time as indispensable forms of any cognition, beginning with elementary perceptions and representations. He says, here, he means, and what I am doing, we employ the Kantian evaluation of the importance of these forms in the cognitive process, that is time and space, but differ from Kant in taking them not as transcendental, but as forms of the most immediate reality." End quote. Uh, there is something breathtaking about Bushing's casual dismissal of the transcendental aspect of Kant's revolutionary epistemology in a footnote. But he makes clear that he's aware that the transcendental is a fundamental feature of the whole system, the, the whole Kantian system. But in the most minor of all forms of commentary, a short footnote, he rejects it. I have suggested that the examination of simultaneity is one way to approach the core of Wachtin's dialogism. And I advance the sheer revelation insouciance of this footnote as an argument for, do, for thinking so. Remember, Kant uses transcendent in the commonly accepted meaning of beyond material experience. It is his way of explaining the universality of time and space in all human thought. These concepts come with being human. We are wired to make sense out of the constantly changing manifold of our experience by using time and space as generalizing tools to bring order into the potential chaos of our perception constantly assaulted as it is by radical and quickly changing impulses from the surrounding environment. As such, the transcendental aspect of knowledge, which makes generalized but coherent representations of the world possible, stands over against the immediately physical perceptions which give us lower level but immediate and specific knowledge of the world. Kant characterized these messages from the actualities of experience, mere intuitions, I'm shocked. <laughs> However, in order for this scheme to succeed, representations and intuitions must work together. For Kant, thinking is making judgments. And all judgments, he argues, are functions of how we make sense of what we perceive among our representations. Thus, the two engines of perception must, by definition, work together to form what Kant calls uh, a union of good Quote, the concept must contain that which is represented in the object that is to be subsumed under it. In other words, concepts and things must be brought into simultaneity. Singular events, intuitions, must be made simultaneous with recurring patterns, representations, to conform to the normative patterns of time and space. This insistence on synthesis is at the core, of course, of Kant's critical philosophy. Many attempts have been made to understand Kant's explanation for how such a union might be made possible. But none has gained anything like a universal acceptance, leaving a gap, Kant calls it a kloof or chasm, uh, that needs to be closed. Kant's own answer to the possibility of a synthesis is found in the infamous chapter that opens the second section of the Transcendental Doctrine of the Power of Judgment, and it's been found far from compelling by all subsequent critics. This aspect of Kant's argument is insistence that this synthesis is the first condition for thought is particularly relevant to Bakhtin's footnote and its significance for dialogue in general. Kant's convoluted answer to the question of how patterns, representations, and events, intuitions, can be joined together results in his introduction of another concept, the schema, he says of it. Now, it is clear, I'm, I'm quoting now from the uh, first critique, now it is clear that there must be a third thing which has to stand in homogeneity with the category the pattern, uh, uh, and the, on the one hand, and the appearance, the event, on the other, 
and which makes possible the application of the former to the latter. Above and beyond Kant's actual formulation of the schema, note that it is based on the primacy of certainness at its core, a point which he drives home by using a triangle as his premium example of the schema. In doing so, he makes clear his inclusion in a dialogue that goes back at least to Plato's failed attempt to define the relationship between the pattern of a bed laid up in heaven and the event of a bed in which we go to sleep every day. <clears throat> the platonic gap between Eidos and Eidola was, of course, what Aristotle was seeking to overcome by introducing the tripartite syllogism, major premise, minor premise, conclusion, as the basic tool of slaughter. The history of thinking complex relations between patterns, events, and multiples of three includes as well the centuries long debate among Christians about the triune nature of the Godhead. When the Council of Nicaea answered the question of how a sacred God and a profane man could relate to each other, something the ancient Greeks could never do, uh, they, they came up with the concept of the Trinity. The timeless Father and Son, who erupted into history in the Roman Empire, were the same, homoousios, same substance or as essence, because they were conjoined by a third thing, an enveloping Holy Spirit. More recently, breakthroughs in our understanding of how language works have been achieved through recognition by thinkers such as Saussure and Charles Saunders Peirce that the nature of linguistic sign is, is triumphant. Now, I suggest it is not erythromania, although that might be, <laughs> uh, uh, or, or Kabbalism, to suggest that in these and many other examples that could be provided, Kant's turn to thirdness as his key to simultaneity can be seen as a local intervention in a long chain of events uh, to under, uh, of attempts, a long chain of attempts to understand how elements can be conjoined in an architectonic system that is based on thirdness. Remember, we are talking here about what Kant called the deduction of the pure concepts of the understanding, where he raises the question of the possibility of combination over at, at all. Uh, 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 the uh, the stakes of its possibility are very high. The stakes of, of making such a th synthesis are very high because he says the synthetic unity of apperception is the highest point to which one must affix all use of the understanding, even the whole logic and after transcendental philosophy. Indeed, this faculty is the understanding itself. That is, the making of connections is the core of understanding. And further, combination does not lie in objects and cannot be borrowed from them through perception, but only through the operation of the understanding, which is itself nothing other than the faculty of combining a priori and uh, the manifold of given representations under the unity of apperception, which principle is the supreme one in the whole of human cognition. I mean, there are several other ways in which he points to the significance of the act of bringing these two things together. Having stated the ultimate necessity of the relation of simultaneity, the question arises of how to create such a synthesis. The answer for Kant lies in what he calls the schema. He said, as I said before, he says that there is some third thing which must stand in homogeneity with the concept on the one hand and the appearance on the other. So it is in any case, uh, no matter how you relate Bakhtin to Kant, I mean, it is at least chronologically accurate to note that Bakhtin enters the historical conversation at a particular point in time when thinkers were preoccupied with what to do with Kant's leaky architectonics. They wrestled in the shadow of Kant's failure to specify just what it was that constituted the thirdness of the schema. It is against the backdrop of these neo-Kantian debates that Bakhtin enters the scene. The enormous role played by neo-Kantian philosophy in his thinking is well known. But most commentators, including myself, uh, have emphasized the role of Hermann Cohen's Marburg School in that regard. 
and rightly so. I mean, Bakhtin's great friend, and in many ways the co-mentor of the early Bakhtin circle, Matvei Kagan, had after all written a dissertation on the problem of transcendental apperception from Descartes to Kant under Cohen's supervision while studying at Marburg in 1914. And as Brian Poole has demonstrated in Bakhtin's book on Rabelais, he shamelessly plagiarizes another member of the Marburg school, Ernst Kassir. I mean, for pages he goes for that. Shameless. <laughs> and, uh, but neo Kantians were everywhere in Germany as Bakhtin was coming into maturity. And I now argue that too little attention has been paid to Bakhtin's relation to works of the Southwestern Baden school of neo Kantians, notably the, the famous figures Wilhelm Windelband and Heinrich Schwechert, but including as well. Uh, a younger generation who were responding to uh, Vintelbans and, and, and Lickert. I wish to stress the importance of two of these thinkers for, for two reasons. Uh, Lipsch's uh, psychological aesthetic magnified the role of empathy in aesthetics. And anyone who has read, uh, 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 especially uh, the, the first article to which I referred, uh, uh, on uh, aesthetics, will be aware that empathy is, is, is a very important aspect of his uh, conception. Um, that force is felt so strongly, empathy, uh, uh, in Bakhtin's art and answer ability. So that there is some, I am feeling aesthetic is something I think should be further studied uh, uh, in, in understanding uh, what's going on at the beginning uh, of Bakhtin's career. Uh, and Foucault should be remembered because he provides the most comprehensive account of the category that I'm going to spend some time now talking about, the category of transcredience uh, before Bakhtin. I, I stress this last because I'm going to argue that transgredience is the term Bakhtin needs to justify his dismissal of Kant's ascription of transcendence to the categories of time and space. Remember, Bakhtin says he agrees with the Kantian evaluation of the importance of these forms at his time space in the cognitive process. But he goes on to say, we differ from Kant in taking them not as transcendental, but as forms of the most immediate reality. The first time Bakhtin himself uses transcredience as a, a term of art is in Author and Hero in Aesthetic Activity, that first article. Uh, uh, or the, 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 the first book, I, 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 I read the first study, uh, the lengthy study that, that he authors, where he lays out the extraordinarily <coughs> complicated drama that unfolds when two persons confront each other in life. It is here that the crucial dialogue comes into play between perceptual categories appropriate to the self on the one hand and the very different categories appropriate to the other. Uh, this is, uh, everybody knows this about my team, but I feel the necessity to go over it in some detail again in, in order to make clear where I see a break occurring. A person, even when alone in the midst of the Sahara Desert, is already in dialogic relation with the world insofar as he will necessarily perceive such a moment through two different sets of perceptual categories. Those that pertain to his unique place in time and space, let us say the precise coordinates of his position in the desert as they would appear on a map, and at the particular moment in time we are discuss discussing, let us say, 2.34 p.m. in the afternoon of January 25th, 1951. From the point of view of transcredience, such a stranded subject will make sense out of what is happening on the basis of information derived from the absolutely unique place and time he and only he physically occupies in existence. From that singular place, everything not in it is the person or world occupying it outside. And all those things in outsideness, in the Khadimist, belong to a very different set of conditions. Differences between the two sets of categories must be reconciled if we are to perceive the world accurately. This is where Bakhtin agrees with Kant. 
But his method for creating simultaneity in a unified art of tectonics differs fundamentally from the Kantian model of the schema insofar as it substitutes transgredience for transcendence. I, I, it's a topic for possible discussion later. I, what, what I'm skipping over is the very great difference between the Kantian concept of the subject and the Quartinian subject. Uh, at any rate, in the first article he ever published, Quartin had asked, as we saw, but what guarantees the interconnection of the constituent elements of a person? And he answers, only in the unity of answerability. I have to answer with my own life for what, for what I have experienced and understood. Now, this dialogic framing of the difference between I and the other is, of course, at the heart of what Dean's concept of the chronicle. I turn to it now because it is the essay where the footnote on which I'm commenting in this paper appears. It does so in a work that makes particularly ambitious claims for the power of the architectonic master key of the, of the chronotope that he is introducing. The central importance of the chronotope in human perception is emphasized in the 1971 editions to the original chronotope essay where Bakhtin says, and I'm, I'm quoting now from the 1971 manuscript, every entry into the sphere of meanings is accomplished only through the gates of the chronotope. So the chronotope has the, the central, has the key to our perception of the world. The question must arise, if time and space, and space are everywhere in Bakhtin, and not just in this essay, doesn't it seem to have the kind of universal presence that led Kant to define them as transcendental categories? How can something so unavoidable in any perception as space and time be conceived as imminent? Kant's argument had been that they were universal because they were beyond experience. That is, they were different from the reality of ideas we might generate from the immediacy of human interaction. As such, they trailed the extra-worldliness that historically had attached to the sacred in the past. They were so far beyond the capacities of mere human beings, they could not be understood without invoking a layer of reality that was higher than and prior to any merely mortal presence. Like Plato's distinction between ideas and reflections, Kant's turn to the transcendental fails to incorporate the means by which his extra experiential terms could be joined together with the teeming heterogeneity confusion of lived experience. As such, Kant's transcendent claims for time and space were open to the same charge of incompatibility that could be made against any claim to the sacred, whereas Durkheim put it, the sacred is absolute, and I quote from Durkheim now, which I believe is our best definition of the sacred. Um, he says, um, in all the history of human thought, there exists no other example of two categories of things so profoundly differentiated or so radically opposed to one another as the sacred and the profane. The traditional opposition of good and bad is nothing beside this, for the good and the bad are only two opposed species in the same class, namely morals, just as sickness and health are two different aspects of the same order of facts life. While the sacred and profane have always and everywhere been conceived by the human mind as two distinct classes, as two worlds between which there is nothing in common. This is from the elementary forms of religious life. The result is, he says, that there is nothing left by which to characterize the sacred in its relation to the profane except their heterogeneity. There can be no fusion. In the heterogeneity of Kant's transcendental categories to everyday experience, it is the heterogeneity of Kant's transcendental uh, categories to everyday experience that leads Bakhtin to reflect it, reject it. But how nevertheless explain their necessity in dialogue? What other than their utter difference from each other justifies their absolute ubiquity otherwise? How else create a true simultaneity between their universal presence and our particular existence if we deny them 
transcendence. If you do not accept Kant's theory of the schema as an explanation for how human events connect to extra historical pattern, where do you turn? In Joaquin's case, the answer lies, I'd suggest, in the important role that Sirtis plays in his thinking. Joaquin's dialogism is from the, out, is from the outset defined by Sirtis of various levels and kinds, which he formalizes in the late essay, which is really a set of notes, uh, entitled by his editors, The Problem of the Text. These notes are replete with dicta, such as the event of the life of the text, that is, its true essence always develops on the boundary between two consciousnesses, or understanding is never a tautology or duplication, for it always involves two and a potential third. And he proposes a fundamental element of any utterance, a super and not interessat, not any, it which, above which he says, not any mystical or metaphysical being, although given a certain understanding of the world, it can be expressed as such. He is a constitutive aspect of the whole utterance. Now, as is well known, our certainness has many facets. In fact, from the primordial initial assumption we make that our utterances will be understood, if we make them, to its status in certain beliefs defining the ultimate transcendency of God. But thirdness is perhaps best understood when incorporated into Bakhtin's translinguistic model of dialogue, the recurring description he gives of two people encountering each other as each negotiates the condition of his unique emplacedness. Each is outside the other physically, but as well outside of that which is visible uh, to the other from his unique situation in our encounter. But the fact I cannot see something that is present does not mean that it is not there. My blindness is merely another index of the uniqueness of my place and existence. What I cannot see behind my back is really there. It is merely transgredient to my present position in time and space. And the same is true for my partner in the conversation, just as what is behind his head is transgredient to his unique place and existence. We share a positional or spatial blindness insofar as we both, at the time we meet, cannot perceive certain aspects of the space in which we meet. But this does not mean that we cannot see what we cannot see is not real in the sense that it shares the same ontological class as those things that we can see. What is invisible to me exists for my partner and what he cannot see uh, it's just for me, I should pause to say, I, I, I know there will be some people who will be ir irritated by my using he as, as uh, uh, subjunctive in this case. I, uh, I'm very old, and uh, I, it, 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 it's a way of economizing. So, uh, here's she. Uh, but this does not mean that we cannot see is not real in the sense that it shares the same ontological class as those things we can see. The world is there for both of us, and therefore not outside our experience. It is not transcendental. Portions of it are merely transcendent. And as such, it is available to our examination and thought. The key point here is that unlike transcendence, which dreams of unifying two aspects of reality that are defined precisely by their incompatibility, transcendence envisions elements that are capable of being included in an architectonic because they share the same ontology. This crude example, and I, I and oft repeated the example of transcredience, can be and should be expanded to include the vast multitude of things that are on the same plane of being, but which exist outside us at any given time, and which we therefore cannot see from our unique position in a particular existence. This is true, of course, not just of things physically present, but behind our area of vision, but of experiences and ideas that are abroad in the world, but of which at any given moment we are not thinking. The fact that they are not present does not mean that they exist in a totally different reality. We can, through dialogizing thought, create a simultaneity between things that are transgredient to us because they participate with us in the dialogue of the world we share with them. It is not by chance uh, 
as the artist used to say, that Bottin chooses to abandon a crucial aspect of Kantian system in an essay on Cronito. He makes clear in another footnote in the same essay, containing the footnote that I've been discussing, that he derived the term Cronito from a lecture he had heard in 1925 by Alexei Uchtinsky. The unusual Bottinian act of naming a source, and, and accurately, is significant. Uchtinsky was a great character, a true original. He was both an outstanding scientist and a learned humanist. He had studied philology at Moscow Theological Seminary, and, and I could read uh, all the classical languages plus Hebrew. He was also an Orthodox priest and a monk who belonged to the old ritualist Bielokrytskaya Sinclassia branch of the old believers. He was widely admired by non-believing intellectuals who were fascinated by this eminent physiologist who would work in the laboratory after donning a white laboratory coat over his monk robes. But he was also admired for the innovative work he did on governance in the human nervous system. The work of the great British physiologist Charles Sherrington had demonstrated that human nerves were not organized as a single unified system, but rather was made up of many different kinds of nerves that communicated through a network controlled by electronic impulses running through synapses. The great question was, how did the system decide to do what, when? How did it govern, make decisions about when to turn on and off certain nerves and activate, and activate certain others? Sherrington's answer, uh, which was not accepted by anybody but it appeared, uh, was that the most excited nerve center took the lead role, which is kind of common sense. Uh, unsatisfied with this explanation and following the great tradition of Russian brain research of the section of Pavlov and Vyedinsky, uh, with whom, by the way, uh, uh, Uchtinsky collaborated on the research that led to the discovery of the Vedinsky inhibition which is a major concept in physiology today. Uchtomsky went on to explore the presence of anticipation in neuronal activity. It was to this question of how human nervous system organized itself into a working architectonics that Uchtomsky directed his research until he died during the German blockade of Leningrad, uh, another reason to hate Nazis. Uchtomsky worked with cats. Uh, he worked with cats, whom he'd frighten as they were urinating, studying how their nervous system would, as it were, decide to shift from one set of actions to another. That is, why they would stop peeing and start running. He concluded that there was a dominant nerve function that governed the many changes of impulses required by active and complex organisms like human beings. It was for his research on neuronal dominance that he was awarded the Lenin Prize. Uh, although he had been arrested many times during his life, and his brother, who was also a priest, had perished in the gulag. I mentioned Bakhtin's uncharacteristic description of a source in his first footnote to the Chronotope essay, because it may help us understand why time and space might continue to be so universally present in forming human perceptions but whose omnipresence in thought need not be defined, therefore, as transcendental. Uchtomsky was essentially a physiologist who attracted Bakhtin because he was both deeply religious and also rigorously scientific, combining two spheres of essential interest to Bakhtin, especially since Uchtomsky worked on the nervous system as if it were a communication system, a, a network that operated by conducting information in an enormously complex dialogue among neurons. Schleiden and Schell's definition of the cell was understood by Uchtomsky as similar to the phoneme in linguistics. That is to say, it was understood as the body's minimal unit of meaningful difference. Now, Bakhtin and the body is, of course, a favorite subject of study, uh, but with the some honorable exceptions. Uh, uh, what is usually treated when that topic is taken up is the grotesque body that Bakhtin uh, writes so much about in the Revelation. But if we begin by assuming that the heart of everything he did 
Bhaktit was meditating the mystery of how different orders of reality could be made simultaneous, that is, the central mystery of relation itself, a possibly more complex conception of how embeddedness in our bodies relates to the master category of dialogue. Similar to the perceived non-compatibility of the categories of sacred profane and transcendent transgredient, until recently it was assumed that there loomed an utter difference between the physicality of the body, the sheer meat of it, if you will, on the one hand, and on the other, such comparatively abstract categories as philosophy or literature. Already in the 1927 Volusian of Book on Freud, physical attributes of the body were employed as an argument for resisting Freud's psychoanalytical model based on an unlanguaged unconscious. The central charge against Freud was that he had psychologized the somatic which gives you some idea about the priority of embodiedness it has in, in, in Bhakti. But Ujjumski's concept of a physiological dominant was part of a much larger recognition being made at that time of the newly perceived physiological bases for what had previously been thought to be metaphysical categories. Helmholtz's 19th century drive to provide a physical base for the Kantian categories was crucial to this new perception, of course. But the work of Helmholtz depended on arguments deriving from different perceptual senses, auditory and visual. Ur Buchtumski sought to understand neuronal function in its entirety, not just as it applied to the physical organs of perception. Buchtumski attempted to translate Einstein's relativistic version of time-space into interneural communication. What's important, I repeat, is that he sought to integrate the whole of the body into a coherent system of governance. The significance of such work for the argument I'm making becomes clear in subsequent research, much of it very recent, in the new science of chronobiology, enabled by the ability of computer technology to crunch data for millions and millions of observations. Such study revealed with new force the fact, as Uchtomsky had argued, that the body cannot be conceived in any singularity manifest in itself. Rather, the body is tied to its environment in an urgent and fundamentally defining way. It is less a certain amount of space filled by sheer matter as it is a quivering set of relations, uh, as a quivering set of relations. Claude Bernard was the first to suspect this internal dialogue calling it milieu interieur, but it was Walter Cannon, uh, it was his attempts, Walter Cannon's attempts at Harvard, to define what he called homeostasis, that defined the body's workings as an internal environment whose operations are in constant interaction with each other, and another environment outside the ultimate as As work by researchers, such uh, recent work by, by researchers such as Franz Halberg, and Irving Zucker has shown body clocks organize the activity of cells, tissues, and hormones in a way that uses time to provide internal information about external conditions. The body is in constant communication within itself and in its interaction with the outside environment. It is in its essence dialogic. As such, it makes less mysterious Bakhtin's claim that every entry into the sphere of meanings is accomplished only through the gates of the chronicle. Now, I have argued that in his search for the roots of dialogue, Bakhtin spent his life meditating the laws of relation. And that a key point in that, understate, in that undertaking was his rejection of transcendence and his corresponding insistence on transcredience. In so doing, I have very carefully avoided uh, what such a rejection might mean to those who seek to understand Bakhtin's complex relation to Russian orthodoxy, in which the ultimate truths are a specifically Christian version of what Kant called transcendence. I confess that I have never fully understood this aspect of Bakhtin. 
uh, but I do not deny that it exists. What I would say is that even this apparent openness to the supernatural divine can be integrated into a vision of dialogue that conceives it as the most extreme example of the complexity that confronts any thinker, including Bakhtin, who sets out to understand the nature of relation itself. So let me conclude with a parable that I first uh, encountered in the work of one of Bakhtin's most articulate and persistent, very naughty uh, uh, antagonists, uh, uh, the great Russian philologist, Mikhail Kasparov. Uh, the story goes like this. After Columbus returned from his discoveries, he was present at a banquet where uh, others at the table belittled his achievement by suggesting that sooner or later somebody was going to discover the new world. Columbus, angered, replied by challenging his companions to make an egg stand on its sharp body. After all had failed to do so, Columbus took his spoon and gently tapped the egg's bottom and made it stand up. His detractors tried, what? What? <laughs> Was it allowed to break the egg? And Columbus replied in his best Lower East Side accent, so, who said it wasn't allowed? <laughs> uh, uh, this parable is usually advanced to illustrate how a brilliant idea seems simple after its discovery. Uh, Gaspardov derives a much subtler lesson. He says, for Columbus, all that is not forbidden is allowed. For his audience, all that is not allowed is forbidden. <laughs> now, these terms from one of Bakhtin's most uh, assiduous opponents, um, I think, provide one of the best formulae for articulating the difference Bakhtin's footnote seeks to draw between transgredients and uh, transcendence. For Kant, whose theory is still haunted by the sacred, the basic laws of perception are laid up in categories that have a status higher than the immediacy of any existing person. They therefore dictate from outside how each of us shall negotiate our unique place in existence, defining us as similar to the guests at the banquet, whose freedom is curtailed by what they imagine to be forbidden to mere human beings. On the other hand, transgredients, in which, as with Columbus, all that is not forbidden is allowed, is the enabling factor that permits Martin to posit certainness in dialogue as the key to human understanding. Thank you. Questions? Uh, it's hard for anybody who goes on about dialogue not to take questions. <laughs> I, I, it, 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 were there world enough in time? Uh, one question that, that might be raised about this kind of a distinction that I'm making is uh, about the role of uh, Bakhtin's translinguistics in it. In a, another version of uh, noodling about this subject, I mean, I, 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 I shouldn't be going on. I mean, if, if are, I'll be happy to answer questions. But I still have some questions, too. But, but, but I, I, first, I, I'm open to your questions. Uh, well, I, I have many questions, but I have maybe we... OK. Um, um, many questions, or maybe one question that's too big for me to, to be able to synthesize. Uh, but I guess I was curious about what you think, you know, and maybe you didn't mention it because it is so obvious, painfully obvious, uh, what you think of the kind of striking fact that continues to strike me uh, that the author and hero text, which is an attempt to meditate just the, you know, philosophical questions that you, that you brought up, Kant in particular, is a text about narrative that he decides yeah. that it is through narrative that these questions, and you know, it's a kind of, it's a kind of, uh, sh in a way, shocking, once you've estranged it a little bit, it's a shocking statement, right? Because even 
traditional aesthetics refuses to talk about narrative. Here we are speaking not simply of traditional aesthetics, but of transcendental aesthetics. And we believe that transcendental aesthetics is clarified <coughs> in profound ways through narrative. So I guess one, one way to formulate this question in an open-ended way would be what, I, I wonder what your thoughts are on the role of narrative in negotiating simultaneously the question of embodiedness, um, historicity, whether you think that Kant's interest in the schema, uh, in particular in the schema section, in uh, articulating time, or shapes of time, uh, may have something to do as well with uh, whether, in other words, Bakhtin is in, in some sense sympathetic to that solution after all, even though, of course, they move from transcendence or tra the transcendental to the transcredient is taking place at the same time. Or if, sorry, just one last, yeah, yeah, yeah. One last way to formulate, formulate this, would it, be, would it be okay to say, from your point of view, to say that one way in which we move from the transcendental to the transcredian is uh, by moving from meditating on time to meditating on narrative. Uh, yes. <laughs> okay. I, uh, I, I, I'm glad that you, you, you point to the centrality of, of, of narrative. I mean, not just in the uh, author and hero text, but, but especially that. Uh, because um, it, it, it helps explain uh, why it is that so much uh, of Bakhtin's thinking that seems to be uh, in the realm of philosophy is prosecuted through discussion of literary texts. And I, I think uh, the answer to that question uh, advances us towards an answer to the question you're asking. And that is to say that um, narrative uh, is an exercise of freedom with the concepts. That uh, one of the ways in which I, I, we, we, we are able to use our otherness to the world in narrative is to play with time-space. That uh, they, the, the, these categories um, can be, as it were, domesticated in human existence. And, and in fact, the way in which, and this is where I think the connection to uh, the uh, schema passages in Kant uh, can be made. Uh, it, 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 it's the way in which architectonics work is through narrative. That it, it isn't a conscious talking. Of, uh, it, 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 what he's trying to do is uh, to describe, uh, as it were, the act of perception, and he, he doesn't put it into. Uh, the uh, necessary um, uh, multiplicity, I, I mean, the, the historicity, I, 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 among other, I, I mean, he's not big on history in general, but I mean, uh, 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 and I think the reason he doesn't uh, uh, has to do with his, with the, the absence, not only of history, but of language in the, that the whole system. That uh, uh, I, I, in, uh, if, if we were to pursue this conversation, I hope we will, uh, uh, we would have to take into account um, the, the immediate reaction to uh, Kant of a group of uh, uh, contemporary thinkers uh, who, who are, are now referred to in the history of philosophy as the metacritics, uh, but uh, who would include uh, Hamann, uh, uh, Herr, uh, and, and my favorite, uh, Salman uh, uh, Maimon, I mean, who, who 
attack Kant for many of the same reasons that Bakhtin is, 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 is rejecting transcendence. That is to say that Kant is assuming that he can reveal extra human truths in human language. That uh, he, the, the words he, I mean, he invents this whole vocabulary, I mean, Kant invents this whole vocabulary, invents this whole system, but it's all done with words. And they are German words when he's not indicating his Latin or Greek source. And so what, what, what the, the objection that many of these uh, uh, the critics like uh, uh, Maimon made was that he was uh, guilty of many of the faults that haunted the search for scientific truth before the 17th century. That, that is to say that, that uh, it, it is, you know, uh, science, as, as we now know, it gets born when it's recognized that there is a difference between natural language and the kind of knowledge that it is capable of revealing on the one hand, and the kind of knowledge that is available in the language of mathematics. I mean, it's, it's, it's why Bacon rails against uh, uh, natural language. Uh, 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 what, 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 what my mind is saying is that uh, 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 Kant uh, uh, forgets Bacon and believes that using natural language, the natural language of German, he, he can pronounce uh, extra historical transhuman truths. I mean, that, that are equal to the scientific uh, truths uh, that, that uh, was, was being sought in the 17th century. Now, what does that have to do with America? I, I, I think it, it, it has to do with the relation between, the necessary relation between narrative and language. That uh, in order for language to be used as a tool of knowledge, it has to be organized into a narrative of some kind. And uh, so the, uh, one way to understand um, Bakhtin's constant obsession with uh, the novel uh, is to see that as a, a laboratory for experimenting with the limits of what can be uh, known uh, in a fallen world, I mean, uh, uh, that uh, it, 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 it's through language, the organization of language and narrative, that we, we get, um, that, that's how we, we uh, get at uh, the truth of things. Uh, as much truth as we can get uh, through narrative. But does that make any sense? I mean, that, that it, it's, a, um, it's a very complicated question, as you know. <laughs> uh, but 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 with a long conversation. Uh, are there any other? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I just wanted to ask. I mean, uh, whether you can tell us, uh, in your opinion, what is the place in this sort of a, uh, let's say interpretation of Bakhtin as you know, as a sort of a simultaneous and tectonics of being sharing the same ontological stages? What is the place of uh, of sort of a like failed title? like failed architectonics, like failed communication between the various elements of the system, like the body, uh, uh, which might be translated, you know, for the body like in lack of health, uh, for the social uh, sphere as in social conflicts. Yeah. Uh, and because uh, uh, somehow I, I had this impression that, uh, like uh, reading, uh, reading uh, Totoro's book about Bakhtin, that, I mean, uh, what is the sacred for Bakhtin is like this sort of like the perfect dialogue, like perfect simultaneity, like everything is working in a, what Todorov calls like a sort of a chorus of uh, voices. Uh, and uh, for me it was strange also because in the Orthodox Church, uh, and I think that this is one of the, uh, somehow the church is conceived not as a, an institution, but as a dialogue of tradition in which uh, sort of a, it's not just a biblical text or the Holy Fathers, but 
uh, it's a continuous rotation which is simultaneous in the body of the, uh, its members and so on. Mm -hmm. Well, it, 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 one, uh, you're uh, right in uh, recognizing that uh, Bakhtin always emphasizes uh, uh, the the possible good that can result from uh, understanding the world dialogically. Um, however, in precisely those last notes where he's talking about Sirtis, um, he takes into account the possibility of the uh, loss of faith in Sirtis by someone <coughs> who is, say, a prisoner, I mean, uh, uh, or, or uh, is, is dying of, uh, of a disease that, that won't respond to the dialogue with doctors uh, 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 as a possibility. But it, 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 uh, there are very few places where he takes into account the, uh, uh, the, the, the evil. Of, of the world, I, 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 and, and I, 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 I think that has everything to do with the times through which he was living. I, I, I mean, his emplacedness was in the Soviet Union at, at a time of extraordinary repression. I mean, and in his own life, uh, uh, he suffered greatly in his body. I mean, as you know, I mean. He, He's always in pain. Uh, 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 he, he suffered politically, etc., etc., etc. Very little of this is present in the work itself, ex except by, uh, uh, except metaphorically. Uh, uh, why is that? I, I think it's because uh, he's articulating, at, at, at some level, an ethics that is based on existence. I mean, it, 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 it's, it's not an ethical system so much as it is an ethics that's based, it, it, it's, it's very similar. I'm, I'm surprised, I, I mean, there was a book to be written about this. Uh, um, it, it, I, there are enormous parallels, I mean, between Bakhtin and existentialism. And uh, uh, one of the ways in which that manifests itself, I think, is in the um, recognition that uh, there is a way that um, the world uh, could work beneficially, but it doesn't. Uh, so the, 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 what we are left with is in a world that does not appeal to intervention by uh, external intervention by a a, a sacred figure. What we're left with is the immediacy of uh, action, I mean, our actions. Uh, and the possibility for people not responding dialogically, but responding monologically uh, is there. I mean, he, I, he makes that explicit. He just doesn't dwell much on those monologists, uh, but he was well aware of, of, of what was going on. And I think that uh, it, one of the reasons why Bakhtin is not taken as seriously as, as perhaps he might be uh, by many thinkers is, is because it does seem to, uh, the, 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 all the work seems to lack a recognition precisely of um, the very important role that monologue has played in human history and continues to. Um, so you're pointing to uh, a, a real, that seems to be, problem in, 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 in the, the, the system. Um. Thank you so much for your talk. I was actually kind of wondering more um, I'm wondering about transgradient myself, um, so I don't have the answer. I, I, I'm sorry, I, I, I did I, I was thanking you for um, your very informative and extensive 
explanation of the word transgredient. But um, my specific question um, is uh, not very, it's, it's more broad. I was actually wondering, did you originally have an impulse to link simultaneity dialogue and transgredient to Shkolsky and the strange man? Um, and if oh. so, what happened to that impulse? Why did it go away? <laughs> <laughs> a dissatisfied customer. <laughs> okay, where is the Shkolsky? <laughs> okay, I, I love Shkolsky. Hey, uh, uh, um, uh, very short thing. Uh, um, I think that uh, uh, Shklovsky is an enormous figure with a huge library uh, of his own work and then commentary. But what, what, what always emerges in any discussion of Shklovsky is how uh, estrangement works. And uh, if uh, I had included a discussion of Shklovsky in the paper, it would have been to suggest that Shklovsky, too, is part of the ongoing uh, conversation, historically ongoing conversation about thirdness. That um, if you assume the force of estrangement to be more than a simple psychological uh, effect, uh, which it seems to me, in order to take it seriously, you must, um, then it's clear that what he's talking about is um, uh, an almost physiological uh, understanding of shock. That is to say that uh, the, 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 the strangeness that is the uh, subject of us in India is uh, an effect. It's dialogic in the sense that it's, it, it's always between people. I mean, somebody is shocking somebody, or something is shocking somebody. So that there are always at least two. But then in the middle, as always is the case, there is the thirdness of the event. And uh, so the significance of, of, of uh, estrangement when it works is that it participates, uh, or it, it is enabled by, uh, if you will, the dialectic uh, rule um, of, about the importance of what is between uh, two uh, speakers, two, two members of a dialogue. And uh, uh, what the, the putting shock in the center, it's, it's cognitive shock uh, in, in the center, is a way to um, bring uh, attention to what is what has been, as it were, outside the perception of the person who experiences the, 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 the estrangement. That is to say, the the, 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 the model of dialogue can be appropriated as uh, a skeleton for how estrangement uh, works its effect. I mean, more could be done. I, I should say, by the way, having said so much, that, that uh, Shklovsky was not a great admirer of, of Bakhtin and, 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 and would be horrified to hear anybody uh, uh, try to explain him in, in dialogic terms. I, uh, 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 he was a very uh, crusty uh, fellow and um, uh, prioritizing Bakhtin, <coughs> any explanation of a, a concept central to his achievement uh, would, would, would not have been taken well. But I think it works. D does that it, it, it get I, to? I mean, initially, I, I also feel that the estrangement is something in which 
question sense that really derives so much from real life, um, real life phenomena, whereas Bakhtin is just so rooted um, in, 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 a, in a dialogue that, um, you know, as Ilya was thinking too, is so tied to the narrative in the novel form. Um, so I kind of, um, at first I thought that there's a little bit of income, it's a little bit incongruous to take a theory that is based on real life and real life phenomena, like Australia, looking at the stone, stone here, that's these real material life objects, um, and, and comparing it to, um, to something that is so rooted in, in novel discourse. But as, as your talk has brought to our attention, there's so much of real life dialogue Mm -hmm. And real life interaction uh, is is really the thing driving Bakhtin and Bakhtin's theories, and I, I really I really like how you just in well, that theory. Yeah, yeah. No, no, but 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 uh, the, the explanation I, I I tried to give I, I mean it it can be made more complex I, I assure you, mm -hmm. uh, but but, but <laughs> it's a very, very simple form that, that I just gave of of, of as it were dialogizing uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, uh it, you, you, you have an instance uh, that makes clear uh, the central place in dialogism of, of, of what uh, Ilya was talking about, and that is of narrative. Because uh, uh, there is a story at the heart of all estrangement. It is, it's, it is a narrative of, about something happening and its effect. And uh, it's a story that makes no sense unless it's included in a larger narrative. I mean, it is in itself narrative. So the, the, uh, pointing to it, it's the dialogical fundament of uh, uh, Shklovsky's concept uh, is also to point to the uh, hidden narrative that is implicit in all uh, attempts to use the concept to explain uh, what it is. Um, Shklovsky is, is much richer, uh, has many other interesting things to offer. I, I don't know why he, I, I know there, there is now, as you probably know, a neo-formalist movement, and, and uh, they, they, uh, Shklovsky is uh, on many lips, uh, which he would not have been found even 10 years ago. But his um, real importance, I don't think, has, is, is still been grasped. I mean, it, it, if you, you, you put uh, uh, what has happened to Bakhtin, uh, over against uh, Shklovsky's reputation abroad. I mean, it, 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 it and, and, you know, frankly, I, I, I think that that, that that difference doesn't truly uh, represent uh, Shklovsky's uh, originality and, and the place he should occupy in our thinking about the same topics that we uh, number when we invoke Bakhtin. We would have to probably include the the, the para novelistic texts from the twenties. Yeah, yeah. Oh, think, absolutely. Theory, together yeah, with, with, with the yeah, texts, yeah. in order to sort of have a, a richer sense of what what he's mm -hmm. after. Mm -hmm. I always think of of, of Shklovsky as a, uh, whenever I think of the two of them together, I always think of Shklovsky as a Bakhtinian hero. <laughs> there's this kind of picaresque creature, right, who's sort of running around, making a mess everywhere, yeah, yeah. mocking everything, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. And then sort of grotesque himself in, in various ways. <coughs> uh, yeah. yeah. They did live in the same complex and, 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 and would uh, 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 gather for, for a cup of tea. Mm -hmm. uh, Shlotsky would visit uh, Bokhtin because he didn't get around very much. Mm -hmm. Can I ask you one last story? Or I don't mean it to be last, but I just have another Please. question, which is also super broad, but I guess. So um, so there are a number of 
Bakhtin's in quotation marks <laughs> right by now. Uh, and, are you going to uh, I'm arguing they all are. But they all are, yes, yeah. yes, yes. But there, there, there are some big ones, right? So right. there's, there's right. the, right. Right. there is the, um, the way in which he's sort of first received in some ways as a kind of proto deconstruction, postmodernist kind of thinker, right? By the Rabelais book in particular. And then you have this sort of what, in my mind, is a kind of liberal democratic Bakhtin celebrating know how we should all be tolerant of each other's voices and we should all be, uh, be sort of concerned with diversity and all of that. Um, right, and then there's the, obviously there's the Russian Orthodox Bakhtin, right, the, the theory very, yeah. very big, yeah, in, 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 in various uh, circles. And the new Marxist Bakhtin, or, you know, quote, quote, Marxist Bakhtin in, in Britain. So those are four that, that come well, to there, mind. There, there are members in New York as well. There are members in New York, right. right. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, so what I'm wondering, I guess, is do you have a way, uh, I'm, I'm not 100% sure, what, no, what I, wanna, what I want to ask is, is really crudely put, what do you think about that? <laughs> but, but, but I guess I'm not sure. It, it's allowed. It, it, it's a bad level of right, questions right, right. are put. I, 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 uh, I guess I, I'm wondering, you know, um, where 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 would you where would you sort of see yourself at this point? Not in which of these Bakhtins, but how do you integrate or how do you negotiate these these? Uh, uh, I, I, I think uh, the answer it, 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 it's uh, what I feel personally, which I try to give in a very uh, impersonal way in, in, in the paper, is that um, he was a very messy, but very original and exciting mind. And that uh, what explains his ability to be appropriated by uh, Russian Orthodox really deep believers on the one hand, and by uh, radical Marxists uh, on the other. I mean, some of the people I've, I've met in, in the UK I mean, I, are really uh, very far left. Uh, um, but what, what, what unites them, I think, and, and uh, all the others as well, it, it, it would be, I, I mean, there are some of these uh, quotation mark routines that will, I hope, fall by the wayside. I mean, because they, they, they are uh, not addressing what is central, uh, in, in my view, which is his uh, gift for imagining uh, relation. I, I, I mean, I, I know that sounds very abstract, I mean, but the one thing that all of the schools and others that, that one could deduce have in common is that they see um, uh, Bakhtin as the source of architectonic possibilities within their own uh, interests. And uh, with more or less justice appropriate those aspects of the uh, oeuvre, uh, which um, uh, will serve their interests. And that's very Bakhtinian too. Uh, but the, 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 there is no, I, I, I cannot conceive, I, 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 I've tried, a, 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 a unitary figure, and um, I, I, I can't. Uh, um, I, you know, we, when uh, I was working on a biography, uh, Kerry and I made the decision not to, we, we could have, if Bakhtin was still very much alive, 
And we could have met, as it were, Bakhtin. We could, we could have interviewed Bakhtin, and we didn't. And the reason we didn't is because we wanted to write the biography. Uh, uh, and uh, 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 Bakhtin was well known as an absolutely charismatic personality. I mean, it was just, uh, 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 and, and we didn't need that. <laughs> uh, 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 um, so I, I, I think that somehow the 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 image of that, that I had in say seventy one or seventy two when when he, he we would be in Moscow and he would be in Moscow and I would think of this old man uh, with with Kiska his cat uh, 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 sitting in the uh, apartment of the uh, writers' union, um, and we were huddled in quite different <laughs> uh, 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 The temptation to um, go over in order to get a, a, a picture, a, a, a living sense, uh, was, was was very great, mm -hmm. and and I, I I think now in my inability to conceive a unitary figure that I regret not having done that uh, at the time. But I, it, Cause it would I'm, I'm not sure. around the body. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure he would have shown up with paper quotation marks around <laughs> yes. the uh, 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 um, But uh, no, I, and I think anybody who conceives a unitary Bakhtin is missing the point that uh, he is available to widely uh, dispersed uh, appropriations, and uh, it's part of his genius. I mean that he is so various, uh, uh, polyglot. Um, but, but speaking personally, uh, I, I if I do have a single image, uh, there was just I, I think I, I sent a, an article in Yunus of, about the veterinarian who took care of Bakhtin's cat. And um, uh, so, if I do have a unitary image, uh, it, I, it is of of Bakhtin with a very smile, Lewis Carroll yes. cat smile oh, on his face, stroking Kiska right. uh, in in his apartment, and it sort of. Laughing at all that's been done in his day. <laughs> uh, but that comes as close. Similarly, can I ask what needs to be done? Because you mentioned the similarity of existentialism and Bakhtinian thought. So that's in the future, that needs to be discovered. What, what else do you think needs to be discussed? Well, I, I, the, uh, it's a specific research project. I, I think that Bakhtinian's uh, uh, relation to uh, people like Folkhout. Uh, I, I mean, the, 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 everybody knows about this connection. I mean, uh, it, it, I, uh, I mean we, we've known about this for you know, over 20 years now. But nobody, as far as I know, has done any serious research uh, on the, the connection to uh, not so much the Baden school, but to the people, the younger people, who were struggling with the Baden school, like Foucault. Uh, um, I think that would be very important. I mean, it, w w what needs to be done is to uh, uh, find a way to introduce Bakhtin uh, more rigorously into uh, philosophical dialogue, it seems to me. And one way to do that is to um, look into the relations that he had with uh, some of the people whose work is, is, is clearly um, driving uh, some of the major work. Another, I, 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 I think that it's impossible to understand what uh, you know, he calls metalinguistics is without taking into account 
the kind of criticism and the thinking of the, the metacritics in the 18th century. Mm -hmm. That more work on uh, uh, Haman and Bakhtin, on, and especially, I, 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 I wish I had more time now, uh, 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 on uh, 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 Salman Maimon and, and, and Bakhtin. Now, Maimon was the only critic of Bakhtin he took seriously, or uh, uh, forgive me, <laughs> he took seriously in his own lifetime. And uh, that connection has is, is, is simply not been made. Uh, 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 so th those are two things, I, I, I think. But, but uh, <coughs> obviously, more will be done uh, when we have uh, worked out the kinks that have existed from the very beginning in access to the manuscripts. Uh, I, that, that is a, a, a long and um, a sorry story. And uh, it, I, it, it doesn't look as if it's going to get any better uh, very, very soon either. So uh, we need some sort of international commission uh, to be given access to the, uh, the, the manuscripts themselves. They ask what the Russian state thinks about that idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah well, <laughs> I say it's a long, I, 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 this is, uh, uh, utopia both means a good place and nowhere. <laughs> uh, both things are true of the uh, access to the, the archive. Uh, uh, but I, th I think we're, we're, we're at a point now where any more introductions to book are, 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 are <laughs> passe, and that, uh, the, the, what, what I think of as the whole uh, school of uh, copulative Bakhtin scholarship uh, should be discouraged, but it, 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 it's annoying all the time by that copulative. I mean, those people who write books about Bakhtin and, and fill in the name, or you can put anybody in there. I mean, uh, uh, it's just extraordinary. So what, what's needed is uh, philology, uh, and, and what can enable philology uh, in the archive. Um, but, yeah. Could you tell us about uh, Bakhtin's cons conception of the subject uh, compared to Kant? <laughs> We compare. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think during the talk you mentioned briefly that you were skipping over that. Oh, I, no, I was talking, I, I, I'm sorry. I mean, I, this uh, uh, paper utterly neglects the, uh, 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 necessary introduction of uh, Kant's concept of, of who the subject of thinking is, and Bakhtin's thinking about who the subject of experience is, uh, it, 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 it is, you probably, I, 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 I think you may actually know, that, that, that Kant has a very, um, complex uh, idea of the human subject that doesn't even have a pronoun. I mean, it, it, it's just, uh, you know, the, the I think. Uh, and uh, I, I, I think that uh, one of the ways to understand Wachtin's reading of Kant is that it, it, it's a rejection of, of that uh, utter uh, abstraction in, in, in the thinking subject, uh, that whatever else the subject of dialogism is, it, it sure is ain't abstract. Uh, uh, so th that's what I meant, but I, I, I mean, I, I, I would never uh, presume <laughs> to compare uh, 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 Dimitri Kant uh, uh, with, <laughs> with, with, with uh, uh, 
wo er steht. Okay, thank you very much. For